if you look for where we are this year, I'll call it 500,000 tons uh, of demand this year by 2025 uh, or the end of 2025, we're looking at a million. So the industry doubling in the next four years and then more than doubling after that from 2025 to 2030. Uh, it's over 2 million tons. If you ask Elon Musk, he'll tell you it's 3 million. Um, and he's typically been right. My next guest is Jonathan Evans. He's the CEO of Lithium Americas Corp, trading on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol LAC and in Toronto under the same symbol. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Jonathan, Lithium Americas has been one of the great success stories in the lithium space. Uh, I first became acquainted with the company, I think it was back in 2016 or 15, I can't even recall. But uh, the interesting thing to me is Lithium Americas really leapfrogged over all of the companies that sort of started to move towards lithium exploration and production. And maybe we could start with a sort of a historical back look at what was it that gave you guys the edge that caused you to be so successful while so many others were left standing still? Well, I think that uh, first off, it's the, the, the people. So at the end of the day, I, this business is no different than, uh, and I would say it's, it's more technical uh, in nature. So if you look at, uh, I'm going to compare ourselves to high tech or Silicon Valley, you've got to get the right mix of people. They don't necessarily have to be lithium people, but good engineers, good business people, uh, the right culture. And I think that as a foundation is, has always been a strength of the company where if you sort of look at the management team, uh, it, there's a lot of, of folks in that have real experience from the past operators where uh, this has never been a promotional uh, type of company. It's always been one where the mission is to get these resources into production. And then the second piece of that is the quality of the resources themselves. So Kachari Oloros, uh, my own history, I, I knew that resource back in 2008, 2010, uh, back when it was the original Lithium Americas uh, that had the major shareholders were Magna and uh, Mitsubishi. Uh, I was at FMC at the time uh, running that lithium business. Uh, and that resource is, as I think folks can see, is is the largest uh, the largest brine asset, at least in Argentina right now, and in, it's probably number two or number three in in all of South America. Very high quality. Uh, and Thacker Pass the same. Uh, Thacker Pass has this heritage from Western Lithium. The companies merged. Uh, we brought a new team in and uh, put a new process in place after several years of. Of, uh, of work uh, to unlock that resource. And now we're standing on the precipice of, of uh, hopefully starting production or starting construction uh, rather at the, at the end of this year. So, um, and, and then I think beyond that as well is, is timing the market correctly. So we survived through the Valley of death, uh, very bad uh, pricing from what 2017 and bottomed out in 2020 uh, as coronavirus uh, was, was, uh, was all the rage around the world um, and I think we timed the market very well from a uh, tapping the market for, for ATM and then a uh, an equity raise in early 2021 where we have uh, we're very strong now I mean we have our own resources to be able to move these these uh, projects forward uh, at, at the right pace uh, where the right amount of work is done and also we can be thoughtful about who we partner with how we partner and at the same time look the market is really developed very favorably uh, so that's very, very helpful too in that. I don't think anyone expected the EV adoption rate to be what it is today. Right. That's interesting. So the price of lithium has, well, I guess it's gone up by about 5x since the beginning of 2021. And uh, so, I mean, obviously a $70,000 per kilo or per ton cost of lithium, price for lithium is is very helpful to a company like yours. You've got half a billion dollars on the balance sheet. You've got a partnerships with Gang Fang, the largest uh, lithium producers in the world. You've, you've got some of the highest quality assets in the world. But to what extent is the the price of lithium at the current level sustainable? So I, I think the $70,000 a ton, you're looking at really the uh, very small part of the market. It's tip of the iceberg. So what, and I, and I know some of the retail shareholders out here will be angry when I say this, but what's really happening if you look at um, contracts and a lot of the contracts are changing is uh, the levels I think you're going to see when you start seeing public companies report is more in the twenty to thirty thousand dollar range. Um, in China itself, there's folks that are um, uh, I'm going to say hoarding, but being very opportunistic, uh, holding on. Uh, and I think we've we we're at a level now where you're seeing pricing sort of uh, level out the spot price that seventy thousand dollars a ton. It's not moving a lot uh, week to week. 
Um, behind it, though, the public companies and other operators that are in the space are working closely with their customers. But pricing has certainly gone up from, I think we, we bottomed out at somewhere around $7,000 a ton. And, and I think you're going to see regular pricing above $20,000 a ton for the foreseeable future. And I say foreseeable future years uh, going out. And that's helpful because uh, the biggest issue that we've had in this industry is, uh, is capital, is investing and uh, uh, basically investing ahead of the curve. So uh, if you look at Albemarle, if you look at um, lesser extent S SQM, Livent, uh, they had plans and they were moving forward on capital investment. Uh, coronavirus hit and everything was suspended. Uh, and now look where we bounced back very quickly. This happened in the great financial crisis of uh, 08 and 09. I was in the industry then and we were told, I'll stop everything, don't do any expansion. And then everything bounced back in 2010 and 11 and everybody was left short and pricing went through the roof, although at a, off a much lower scale. So um, this industry has always had that problem because frankly speaking, the companies in it are small. Uh, I, I, we look at the, the, the lithium giants or lithium majors, but uh, you see moves like by Rio Tinto coming in this year, you will see much bigger companies come into this sector now and it's needed. You need people with strong balance sheets who have a long-term vision that are willing to, to invest through the cycles uh, to be able to get the industry the material that it needs because the growth rates now are unprecedented. Right. So in South America in particular, there's been increased sensitivities expressed in the media towards environmental impacts of saltwater pond evaporation methodologies and, uh, and, and water usage. And so I've been seeing a lot of uh, sort of buzz about direct lithium extraction technologies that seek to mitigate water use and environmental contamination through essentially chemical processing that reduces that requirement. Is direct lithium extraction an important segment within your future strategy? It could be. Uh, all the solutions depend on the deposit, so they're all bespoke. Uh, I have a lot of experience with uh, BLE, which is uh, a fancy word for, for water treatment. Uh, if you look at Livent or, or FMC, they've been using the, a method with uh, selective absorption now for more than 30 years. So you can see a DLE uh, process that's, that's been successful. Um, some of the things you need to consider though is A, the quality of the resource. They work quite well if the resource is a good one, which is you know, no surprise. Um, and some of the other assets that you see that are much lower lithium content, say three or 200 parts per million, you have no choice. So you'll see uh, companies that are trying to employ DLE because you couldn't do solar evaporation there. Yet. There's not enough lithium content. It would all be lost in the, the salts that uh, crash out during the solar evaporation process. Yeah. The thing you need to worry about with DLE though is it requires higher energy. It requires a lot of reagents and it does require water. Uh, I, I, the, if you look at Liven's process from a freshwater standpoint, and there's uh, some legal stuff that has gone on in the past with Catamarca province, it requires that something like 85 liters a second of processed water um, from the Los Patos River, which uh, for, for maybe about a little less than 20,000 tons. Uh, our project in uh, at Kachari is somewhere around 130 liters per second of processed water for 40,000 tons. And then if you look at Nevada, it's about 100 liters a second for 40,000 uh, tons of processed water. So you, you always need water. Uh, everyone will say, I can put solar in for power and I can recycle and so forth. You got to balance cost and OPEX and CAPEX, but um, it is a, a potential solution, A, to avoid uh, additional capital investment for the ponds themselves, which are hard to manage too once you put them into place. Uh, and then B, uh, you can avoid um, handling as much brine, if you will, uh, putting it out in that uh, and inventorying it in, in those fields like that. I think it's part of the uh, solution set, but I don't think it's going to be the, the new solution set because it just depends on the resources that you're dealing with. It's been tried in China quite a bit, in Western China, and it, it, it's difficult there because there's a lot of impurities. So it's a real challenge. Um, I think you'll see... Albemarle and SQM, and I think you'll even see us look at ways for us to uh, optimize the process uh, and reduce water consumption as much as we can uh, with some derivations off of DLE, but I don't think it's going to be the next thing necessary to replace what's been practiced and, and relied on for, uh, for decades now. Mm -hmm. Does, uh, do you feel any sort of uh, threat in the future on the horizon from non-lithium battery chemistries? 
Uh, I don't. Uh, I think sodium batteries, uh, there's some great promise in that, but if you look at the, the weight uh, to energy ratio, there's going to be much bigger, heavier batteries. So perhaps for uh, stationary, for renewables, that's a potential solution. We've heard about vanadium batteries as well. Uh, I think for mobile applications, whether they be vehicles or, of course, um, uh, handhelds and personal electronics, lithium will be continue to be the solution. It, you, it, you can already start to see it where um, cobalt was a big issue, and, and that's started to be uh, uh, factored out, where we went from LCO in the early days now where cobalt's not talked about very much. It's been replaced by nickel, uh, and nickel actually can be, um, can, can be taken out as well if you move to lithium iron phosphate. So I think at the end of the day, you're going to see lithium as a common denominator, which it's not an element that's um, potentially or, or, or is uh, rare around the world. It's never really been tapped very much, but I think you'll see ways to avoid and simplify the supply chain by folks like Tesla and others where I just got less things to worry about. First, I can take out cobalt and if nickel continues to uh, be in the situation it's in for a long period of time, you're already starting to see a move t- towards more lithium iron phosphate for entry level cars and for mid level cars. I think if, if you think about, you know, Toyota Corolla, Toyota um, Camry type of cars, those types of things. And then the high nickel chemistry is more reserved for premium vehicles. I think you're going to see more of a bifurcation like that to help uh, manage the supply chain challenges around some of the issues that you've seen so far. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so you've got plans currently to bring on stream about uh, 60,000 tons per year in the near term, and then the Thacker Pass constitutes even more production in the future. And you were talking a little bit about uh, the quality of lithium brine deposits having a bearing on how, how appropriate they might be for different direct lithium extraction technologies. So. In your view, what constitutes a quality brine in terms of parts per million and impurities? Uh, if you look at, say, Humber Marto, where Livent is, or Pasco is, is operating now, or Capchari, uh, or even Pastos Grandes, they're above 400 parts per million uh, uh, lithium content. They're also low in other impurities, especially magnesium, uh, so uh, less than... Five, five to one ratio magnesium to lithium, to lithium it becomes easier then to uh, to separate magnesium it can become difficult to separate from lithium just given their their sharing they're both alkali metals um, I think that that's when you, there's lots of different ways to look at it but those those two areas lithium content and magnesium are ones that uh, I think you need to look at for any brine asset the other thing too which isn't often talked about is logistics so uh, is there an ability to get to the site easily in terms of roads and or uh, is there infrastructure nearby? So um, if, you're, if you're looking for lithium, by default, you're looking for water. We, we talked about that earlier. You need a, f- a fresh water source for any of these types of technologies. Uh, and you also need power. Um, solar is always an answer, but it's more supplementary. Uh, whether you have natural gas or you have um, electricity from the grid, uh, you're going to need something nearby that you're building an industrial operation. So all these elements, in addition to having a, a decent quality deposit, all need to kind of come together, which, you know, if you look at uh, all of those factors, uh, you're more limited into, into where you can, you can move next. Sure. The, um, I visited the, the Puno in Argentina and several deposits in Salta province um, back in 2015, I guess it was. And, uh, and that was the, one of the primary issues was the local sort of uh, belief was that there wasn't enough power to put, to process all the lithium that was up there at the time. And uh, there was some question as to where that power was going to come from. Where is the water going to come from? So how have you mitigated that limitation in Argentina and Chile? Uh, So where we are in Argentina is a a great spot. Cachari has, number one, a federal highway, which runs right through the middle of the Solar. So Route 52 is a sealed road that runs from Anafagasta all the way to Buenos Aires, which is maintained by the Chilean government or their Argentine government, respectively, depending upon what side of the border you're on. We have uh, two sources of power uh, local to us. One is from the grid. Uh, the other, we have the largest solar project in Argentina, uh, which is right on the southern end of our solar, which is put at 300 megawatts. And there's another, there's actually two more projects that are in Salta province because it's right on the border that are solar projects as well that 
your point, that's one of the reasons, one of the ways the, the response has been is to put these solar farms in uh, to supplement the grid uh, in that part of Argentina. Um, and then from a water standpoint, Argentina, typically, uh, we get much more rain than Chile. I mean, it's all relative. It's very, very dry. You've been there uh, before. But we have water sources in the north and at the south part of Cachari. Uh, and then in Salta, it kind of depends where, where you are. But I, I think there's been some improvement in infrastructure, especially in Argentina, in addition to uh, a, an openness by the government where you can look at the situation in Chile now. It's much more difficult, uh, just given lithium is controlled at the federal government level and um, you have to um, negotiate with the government over concessions, as you can see with that SQM and Albemarle has been through. Argentina is much, much different where we have the right to extract lithium until it's exhausted. It's much more provincial level, uh, and we have, uh, we have plainly just more water. So it's not nearly a concern like it is in the Atacama, which is the driest place on Earth. Mm. Okay, and finally, what does the demand scenario look like for lithium going out? You see all kinds of crazy numbers painted by different elements in the industry depending on their interest but from where you sit what do you see the uh the demand curve looking like going out five ten years yeah it keeps getting revised upwards so uh if you look for where we are this year i'll call it five hundred thousand tons uh, of demand this year by 2025 uh or the end of 2025 you're looking at a million so the industry doubling in the next four years and then more than doubling after that from 2025 to 2030 uh, it's over 2 million tons. If you ask Elon Musk, he'll tell you it's 3 million. Um, and he's typically been right. So it's somewhere between 2 and 3 million tons, which is just unprecedented growth that's going to be needed over the next uh, seven or eight years to, to support. I think what you see and your, your viewers see is the government doesn't have to do anything anymore around electric vehicle uh, beyond perhaps charging stations. The consumer has decided. Uh, the market's decided. Every time these vehicles are launched, we have to wait a year now in some cases or more for to get some of these vehicles because the public really likes it, especially in Europe and in the U.S. China is already well ahead, but uh, these two markets, which are the second and third largest markets uh, for, for vehicles globally, people are excited about it, especially now with the Ukraine invasion and the price of oil and gas. Uh, it, it's exacerbated things even more. Right. Right. Okay, Jonathan, I really appreciate your time today. It's a great story, and we're going to follow with interest. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. You bet. Bye for now.